our government doctor has been brutally assaulted, stabbed seven times. Shocking and a brutal attack. The accused posed as an outpatient in reality is the son of a woman, a cancer patient who was being treated by this doctor and had gone through multiple chemotherapies and shifted recently to a private hospital after the family was informed that the cancer had spread to different parts of her body. A probe has been ordered into the incident. But doctors have declared a 24-hour strike at work. All of this has been a grim reminder of the massive protests after the RG Kaur horror, where a doctor was raped and murdered inside a hospital while on duty. But the protests that unfolded for months subsequently in West Bengal and other parts of India were not only for justice for the raped and murdered doctor and the family, but also safe spaces to work for doctors. Health, law and order are state subjects. And this has been at the cusp of a lot of political back and forth between the centre and states as well. IMA has yet again demanded in a statement that superficial damage control won't work. Strong deterrent legislations are needed and exemplary punishment is a must. Proactive safety measures would be required for doctors and healthcare workers in hospitals. Chief Minister MK Stalin has ordered a probe saying safety of doctors is paramount and will be ensured. But remember, it took RG Corp protests for a national task force to be set up as ordered by the Supreme Court. While no violence is acceptable and definitely not violence against doctors, there's a flip side. Where does a patient go and what does a patient do if they or their families have a feeling of being wronged or not being attended to? Is there a system in place that works for an ordinary patient and the family? One can lodge complaint with hospitals grievance redressal system, refer to Charter of Patients Rights for Entitlements, contact relevant medical counsel, file complaints against Consumer Protection Act 1986 and so on and so forth. But how many of these really work? Of course, there's legislations. There's a lot to discuss, though, and allow me to open this to my panelists at this point. I'm being joined by Dr. Shanti A.R., who is the Secretary for Doctors' Association of Social Equality. I'm also being joined at this point by Dr. Rajiv Jaydevan, who is a Vice Chairperson for Research Cell IMA Kerala. Dr. Ishwar Gilada, who is an Infectious Diseases Expert and Secretary General, Organized Medicine Academic Guild, as well as Bejon Mishra, who is a Consumer Activist, and Dr. Anand Bhan, who is a Researcher at Global Health Bioethics. Thank you very much, all of you, for your time. A very sensitive issue that we are going to be discussing. Uh, Dr. Shanti, let me just start with you. There's a strike that has been announced. There's a brutal death that's happened, murder, in fact, of a doctor that's happened in Chennai. You are from there. Uh, what's going on in all of your minds? Luckily, we could save him because of the uh, technology what we have, and he was uh, saved immediately. And this incident is highly shocking. And second thing, it is a deep-rooted social problem. It is multifactorial. And here in this, the treatment was given by uh, Super Speciality Hospital, where we give free treatment for all kind of illnesses from cancer to organ transplant in Tamil Nadu. So the problem here is not money. There is a mild communication gap, the attitude of the doctor, what, what was told. And second thing, the dose of the uh, cancerogen, uh, cancer treatment, chemotherapy agent, which was given. Uh, so it was told by somebody else, so she got angry, all these things. So this shows that there is a big problem, even for trivial things where people are reacting in a very strong manner. Um, attempt to kill, attempt to murder is a very serious thing. So we have to see this issue in a multi-pronged approach. The reasons are multifactorial, so also the solutions. Do, though we have Hospital Protection Act two, uh, since 2008, till now there is no one, uh, FIR was not filed, no one was arrested, and today only we have filed two cases in two different incidents in Tamil Nadu in Chennai. 
So this is the state of affairs. In union government, there is no act. In many other states, there is no act. Even though we have an act, it is not being used properly. So the government, doctors are asking the government to make use of this act properly and have it a display and give it a media, uh, through media, I tell the patients, uh, tell the people that we have such act. And second thing, on behalf of our association, we also met a meeting with uh, our uh, health secretary and health minister. They convened a meeting with all doctors, all association, and we also participated. So we had a demand we gave a demand that the hospital should use uh, okay. hospital protection okay. act should be used properly and we should have a hospital uh, protection committee which should take care of uh, Arjikar incidents like Arjikar and also this artificial and natural disasters and these kind of violences and there should be someone responsible and accountable for that we, we have asked for a committee in each and every institutions. Dr. Shanti, I mean, let me just first correct myself. I said a brutal murder. No, it was yeah. an attempt to murder. It was a yeah. brutal stabbing. So I stand corrected yeah. there. It, it, it was a, a wrong thing that I just said briefly. But uh, moving on to what you are saying, Dr. Shanti, a question which everybody is asking, how can somebody carry a knife inside a hospital? A knife cannot be carried past through even metal detector security places. Yeah. A knife cannot be even carried inside an airport. A knife cannot be carried into any security zones. How does somebody who poses an outpatient carry a knife inside the hospital, get inside the doctor's uh, room, outpatient room, stab the doctor multiple times, try pretending walk as if nothing happened? Yeah, this is hospital is not announced as a safe zone, unlike uh, airport. And so there is no metal detector. There is no such kind of security. There is a security in Amkevats, uh, but that is not that much useful. But there is no metal detector, all these things. So we are the associations, doctors associations are asking uh, to announce the hospitals as a, a security zone. Well, on behalf of our association, I am telling that even if there is such strict mechanism of security, there will be issues. So to, we have to solve the root cause. So there should not be a shortage of uh, doctors, there should not be a shortage of uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, staff nurses or other kind of technicians, all these things. So the proper treatment should be given in time to the patient and the treatment is not only given by doctor the in, in cancer we have our surgical oncology medical oncology and radiation oncology but the thing is that we need to have a clinical psychologist there is a there should be a grief counselor there should be a social worker so we have requested the government to uh, take care of these kind of a paramedical department establishment of such department uh, so that this uh, situation will be handled in a better manner prevention of situation will be these kind of situation will occur we Dr. Rajiv, can I just costume. get you in, Dr. Rajiv? What's... Dr. Rajiv, this is baffling. How can anybody walk inside a hospital with a gun and a knife and not be detected? This would not be permitted anywhere. This would not be permitted in an institution where I am working. This would not be permitted. This would be caught red-handed in any corporate... I mean, how does one walk in with a knife and a gun and... Uh... Please. That's a good question. That's a good question, Sneha, because we are dealing here with a relatively rare form of healthcare violence, which is called premeditated violence. It's increasingly clear that this assailant came planned to attack someone, and that was obviously the doctor who got eventually attacked. Now, premeditated uh, violence uh, involves planning, and people uh, who do this have a history of a criminal background, and they come with assistance. So uh, it is very difficult to escape premeditated violence, especially in a healthcare setting where a doctor is seeing so many patients or even a nurse who's attending to patients. Uh, most of the violence in hospital settings occur in a, uh, what is called a spontaneous type, which is like uh, following a sudden provocation or a change in state of, the hosp of, a, of a patient who does not improve or um, uh, deteriorates uh, against expectation and so on. But here, we're dealing with the first form of violence, which is extremely serious, and we saw what happened in Kolkata, which again was a clear case of premeditated violence. In such, a quest, in such a situation, your question is, will a metal detector help? Yes, even shopping malls have uh, metal detectors as you walk through. Uh, there are people who stop um, uh, customers and, and uh, use metal detectors and so on. So it's not impossible. But the key factor here is crowd control. A hospital is not a place for a social visit. A hospital is not a place where, where uh, random people can walk in and uh, hang around 
uh, observing the proceedings with nothing nothing to do and that has to stop if i were to um, ask if i were asked just one single solution to this there are many solutions we propose the first and most important thing is crowd control if there's a crowd there's a greater chance of violence particularly if someone is drunk someone is distraught or has a history of um, antisocial um, background so these are these are some very important and relatively easy things to tackle second is we need as the doctor said we need a central act that prohibits violence in healthcare se settings you asked a question in the beginning yes what do patients do yes there are redressal for uh, there are redressal forums and our country has a well established legal uh, framework with a lot of luminaries who have formed um, uh, le legislation which is evolving the ima has called for a central act there are legal methods there are civil methods uh, to settle a uh, complaint but i'll end with just one more statement uh, a patient okay. who's deteriorating hmm. does not necessarily imply a fault of the doctor or the hospital or the nurse because human body is not man made it has no instruction manual the doctor will only try to help you if a if a patient deteriorates it need not necessarily be a, a doctor's fault and that is something our society needs to understand things can go against all the well laid plans okay dr ishwar gilada let me get you in please dr ishwar gilada look at what happens in us australia and we have those graphics up on your screen there's legislations in india as well uh, and hospitals are places which are highly emotive there are patients there are families that are struggling they're not only struggling with say health they are struggling with finances possibly it is a very vulnerable situation and in vulnerable conditions a lot of things can go wrong while we don't you know it is a very volatile situation even in hospitals and things can very often go out of hand what i mean what stops india to be extremely hands on protective about spaces like hospitals why are we not seeing it yeah, basically doctors are always considered they are from noble profession they are the soft targets nurses are the soft targets uh, just now dr rajiv said that we need to control crowd but here in this case there was one to one there was no crowd so i think uh, what is lacking is the central act and uh, currently in tamil nadu or in rgkar every party is condemning that we condemn this act but when it comes to parliament when it come, comes to their duty they are lagging lagging behind in their duty there's a bill pending for last two years which is a prevention of violence against uh, healthcare professionals and uh, healthcare establishment act why it is pending for two years for the, whenever there is some kind of bill to uh, increase your salaries of member of parliament it doesn't take more than a minute without any presence they they pass it number 2 this is a doctor patient relationship and communication that is very important and doctors are not taught anything on that so we need to communicate for example cancer in this case the cancer of a fourth stage or third stage or everything was failed so we should have a communication system to tell the family members that look this patient is not going to survive don't keep the patient here keep uh, take for uh, some kind of palliation care thirdly uh, any kind of security is much more uh, lax in a hospital public particularly public hospital you go to hotels there is a metal detector you go to Why? airport you go to courts Why? you go to everywhere there is metal detector here there is no metal so detector so who is responsible for this where does the buck stop according to you with your years of experience where does the buck stop we are talking about 2024 india let's face the facts it's not like hospitals are very cheap or anything even in government hospitals the services the kind of tests that need to be done and people that have to go outside and so forth i mean that's another debate but the fact is what would where according to you does the buck stop who's responsible for this you see bucks in this country works only for oat or not doctors have neither have notes nor have oats we are very very small minority nobody is bothered about doctor security uh, uh, doctors are always considered shaitan when it comes to life but doctor is bhagwan and as soon as the life is saved doctor is shaitan so there is no uh, security for doctors there is no sanctity for doctors no no law is passed even if law is passed it is not even uh, respected no actions are taken no fast tracking what is happening in rgkar for four months doctors are on street there is no strong action and what we have learned from rgkar 
uh, uh, only for big cities like Chennai, Mumbai, they are all reported. In all small, small places, PHCs, everywhere there's a violence. And we, we need to look at it very differently, okay. which is not happening. And we need to mobilize community. We need to have a good law. We need to have an institutional uh, system or a redressal system where something happens. Well, who should be held responsible? And there has to be fast tracking. Unless until you punish people, they will continue doing that because they know that nothing happens in this country. You stab and you go away. And the same person, despite having a murder, he can get a parole. And in parole, he can do another murder. I don't, I don't know what kind of laws we are having in this country. Okay. A lot of crimes are concerned, uh, committed by those people who are on parole. So I think there's something which is seriously lacking and we need to look at. It's not only medical community, but everywhere it is a lax system. I think this is high time. India needs to really change. There have been protests, but what's happened in Chennai, it's absolutely unacceptable. What happened in RG Corps is absolutely unacceptable. And the way the buck just keeps passing on from party to party, from centre to state, it's literally like a no man's child. But let me just go across to this at this point. Dr. Shanti AR, you also made a very important point. And I want to get back to you again. Let me just lay out what we are discussing very clearly, it's a very transparent discussion and we're getting yeah. all stakeholders involved. There is no blame point which is happening at this point. There is just no taking away that violence is not acceptable, violence against doctors is not acceptable. But you did make a point and that was about an attitude concern, concern of an attitude of a doctor and the chemotherapy doses. Now, chemotherapy doses is subjective. And I'm sure that's for an expert panel, for doctors to decide and so on and so forth. That's really beyond the scope. But attitude, many would speak about an attitude. Is that a concern? How are you all as doctors, protesting doctors, doctors at strike in Chennai, Ch doctors who have seen this massive uh, stabbing, brutal stabbing happen, how do you respond to what you just said as possibly a concerns over the attitude of the doctor? Yeah, this uh, doctor is very famous and he's very well known for his soft-spoken nature and he's a very good uh, doctor uh, treating. And coming to the protocol, it is individualized and the institution has got a strict protocol of every drug and what depending upon the patient's condition, it will be decided and it's an, it is a multi-speciality hospital situated in a, a Chennai. So there is no problem with the, the drugs, all these uh, things. But somebody is telling that you have they have given strong dose, immediately the patients are getting angry. All these things really, it is worrisome. And second thing, with reference to the attitude, uh, the communication using the soft skills uh, there uh, the doctors uh, uh, shortage is there and the doctors are made to work continuously for a long time and they need mm. to see more number of patients over a period of 10 years uh, the in, uh, patients coming to the hospitals number has been doubled tripled and are, uh, incidentally the doctors numbers are not doubled or tripled naturally so we need to uh, see the vacancies of the doctors and it should be appointed immediately and according to the patient's number the doctor new doctors post should be created Dr. Shanti, can you tell us in Chennai is it correct that at least 20 to 30 percent post for doctors is not appointed. Is that correct? Is that factual? It is not in Chennai, it is in Tamil Nadu. There is a 2,500 vacancy uh, out of uh, okay. 18,000 doctors are already there because the number of patients coming to the hospitals are increased and especially it is more after the COVID. So naturally we need to think. And more than that, a, a patient with a 90-year-old patient admitted in ICU with a multiple diseases, if he dies, the ho government hospital glass doors are, uh, are broken. So what is the patient's expectation? He's already 90-year-old. He is having multiple problems and admitted in ICU. Even the death of that person is not being taken uh, so lightly in the, in the situation and they are breaking the doors of the government uh, ICU glass doors. So the people should okay. understand that in the disease, disease is a process and everybody cannot be saved. Even doctors are dying, doctor family relatives are dying. So they should understand that it is a multifactorial and we need to see the other aspects also like uh, uh, appointing the other people like MSWs and clinical psychologists, grief counsellors. Okay. All these things are very, very important. Uh, we need to uh, uh, think of those aspects also and uh, uh, visitors pass and then sure. uh, crowd so control system. Yeah. And one thing is, right. even if Dr. the is there, Anand Bhan, if I can get you in. Dr. Anand Bhan, Dr. Anand Bhan, this is, you know, as I have been saying, this is a very sensitive issue, Dr. Anand Bhan. So on one hand, you have this entire challenge of how doctors are overworked. Doctors are not appointed. In Tamil Nadu itself, we have a case right now where the Dr. Shanti has said that there's uh, at least 2,500 posts of doctors that has not been appointed for. That was the same case in West Bengal. Across India, there's a dearth in terms of appointments of doctors. Dr. Anand Bhan, there's also a flip side to this. 
and that is overworked doctors, stretched doctors for the governments. But at the end of the day, there's also consumers who feel that they are wronged. There are consumers who feel that they have not been given the appropriate treatment there are consumers who feel that you know they they were supposed to be in hospital for X number of days that they have been made to stay X number of days uh, the the rates that are allegedly inflated I mean it's not case specific to what we saw in Chennai but this is largely also what's been seen across uh, the states how is how do you look at the larger picture how does how do these two extreme ends get really resolved and what does what do the family options really have an option to? Violence is not an option, but legally, what can they do? Thanks, Neha. So you're absolutely right. And in fact, Tamil Nadu um, is relatively much better in terms of the, the staffing. If you look at many other states, it's even much, much worse in, in terms of the number of doctors, nurses, paramedical staff available. So if you're seeing this kind of violence happen in Tamil Nadu, you can imagine what the situation in many other states would be. Now, the violence um, is, is, a, is a symptom of a larger malaise, and that malaise is, um, is the issue of a trust breakdown which is happening for many reasons, some of which you alluded to. Um, in fact, that there is a deep distrust towards healthcare as it is delivered, there is a feeling that there is exploitation happening, whether it is happening or not is a empirical question. But unfortunately, it manifests in violence, which uh, happens on healthcare providers. And that, of course, happens in uh, tertiary hospitals like the case today, the unfortunate case today. But it also happens to ASHA workers who are working in communities because they are also seen as representatives of the health system. So uh, if, if we see this as an issue, then there is a larger solution which needs to be done. It's not going to be ever enough to just appoint security guards or metals, uh, you know, metal detectors because... Uh, unless we look at the systemic issues, we will not be able to address this. So, of course, strict laws, making sure that no violence is acceptable is extremely important. But we also need to talk about why is there this, uh, cons uh, you know, this cons um, feeling within um, the communities that the uh, health system is not responding to their needs, that it is exploiting, etc. And how do they make sure that there are mechanisms which gre where grievances can be heard in a timely manner and responded to? And of course, we have to also acknowledge that there is a lot of violence within the health system, right? There are there is issues around hierarchy, bullying, ragging, um, obstetric violence as well. All of those are trigger points as well. It's not that violence only happens uh, by patients or caregivers. Within the health system, also there is violence. So we have to look inward as well as outward in terms of solutions. And unless we fix that trust breakdown, I think we might continue to see these kinds of uh, incidents unfortunately happen and and of course that would mean that we need more systemic reform part of which is much better resources more investment in the health system and ensuring that there is more transparency and and accountability for those in power in terms of how they take decisions mr bejon mishra if you can come in mr bejon how do you look at this? I mean, is there a trust, trust deficit? If, if, if Rather than just talking in, in the air, is there a way that we can actually put this across for the medical fraternity, for the ordinary people to understand, is there a trust deficit, firstly? And again, I'm saying, I'm literally being on the defensive because it is important. In no way a wrong messaging can go out. Violence cannot be accepted, whether it be words, actions whatsoever. But we are also looking at a bigger concern here, as crucial and as heartening as it would be about the protection of doctors and caregivers, is also about families that supposedly have concerns over the medical treatment. So, uh, Sineha, I think my panel members have covered all the dimensions which needed to be covered. I don't think anything is left other than a small bit of piece which has got left out. The health being a state subject, the states are having least priority in terms of health care. They are not at all finding it a priority in terms of developing infrastructure, making sure that the health care delivery system is robust, it is of quality, it is made accessible to all in a very easy, friendly manner, and people don't have to take debts or create or sell assets to uh, access health care. You see, what is happening is most of the patients who are in touch with me, they all come with the issue of quality and in terms of quality of service. And naturally, you heard all the panel members saying why they are constrained in not delivering quality, which means the state government has been caught napping. Mm. They are sleeping. They are not doing anything substantial 
to address these issues. And it is a very simple issue that they have to come out with very stringent kind of a regulation, action to be taken. The police has to be made sure that they are triggered in such a manner that they act in a very uh, kind of a focused and prompt and alert manner. You see that today there is a, as many panel members said, there is a huge deficit of trust between all the stakeholders. And it is because, as we can see, in, at least I have seen in the last 45 years, that healthcare has become highly commercialized. And what we have been able to realize is that there are citizens who are supposed to be covered under certain schemes, but they are unable to access those schemes, due to which they are creating a debt, they are you know, taking, uh, you know, selling their assets to take care of their family members. Now, that is definitely going to work mentally on the, uh, on, on the patients and their family. That way, how they're going to clear those debts how they're going to take care of their financial, you know, uh, kind of a casualty. So the point is that we have to understand that the state governments have to invest much more than what they're doing. They have to act in a very speedy manner. It can't be that for the 20, last 20 years we are debating the same issue again and again. How can you start talking the same thing again and again? In my, in my view, if I was a doctor and if I don't find an ecosystem which is protecting me, I will, I will never go to that place to work. Why should I go to work in a place where I am threatened, where I know that I'm, my family will be threatened? Why should I go and work there? The state government should be made to wake up and take action. Where are they today? What are they trying to do? They are making it a mockery. In my view, it's a, become a mockery. Healthcare is paramount. We have to make sure healthcare providers, all the doctors, all the hospitals, are well protected, they deliver quality, we have to make sure that, we have to make sure that all the patients go back with a smiling face, we have to make sure that right. it is made accessible and affordable, they don't, they don't need to take, get into financial crisis, all these factors have to work, and we have been working on that, we have been, uh, you know, shouting from the top of the roof that the budget for healthcare has to increase much more than what it is today. It has to it right. increase at least five times more. Right. And even in the resources which are being spent, they are spent in a very inefficient manner. You can see that. You can see the plight of the government hospitals, how they are being functioning. You can see how the quality of care has been compromised. All right. Let me just get in Dr. Rajiv Jaydevan to respond to what you have said. Dr. Rajiv Dev, uh, Jaydevan, you heard Bejon Mishra speak. Now, there are two aspects to what he is speaking. One is the inflated bills, the commercialization of the medical profession. Um, and the, the other aspect of what he is speaking is why should a doctor go to work if there's not a space safe, a safe space to, be, to work being provided, which is what all of the doctors have been claiming. How would you look at what he has said? Uh, both are pertinent points, and India, as you know, uh, a substantial proportion of healthcare delivery is privatized. And then, even though there are insurance schemes available uh, to all strata of society, it doesn't always necessarily work the way we expect them to. Secondly, it's so true what he said about um, the healthcare fraternity in general, particularly the doctor community, feeling that uh, it is no longer a safe place to work. And so, many doctors, in fact, are discouraging uh, their younger uh, generations from taking up this profession for uh, uh, for this particular point alone, that your life could be at risk and you might not come back alive uh, when you go to work. And that's a sad state of affairs. But there are solutions to this. There are solutions. India uh, is a, uh, has a, has a large population. We cannot equate uh, the doctor-patient ratios or the 30-minute consultations or 15-minute consultations that developed nations that are far less populated can afford. But within our constraint, I think if we put our mind uh, to it and if all the stakeholders work together, we can create a system where a patient's needs are addressed uh, in a peaceful, serene, um, and controlled environment where the doctors, nurses, and other people can uh, address the patient's questions, communicate properly, listen properly, and address their needs. So that is one. Uh, secondly, violence of any form cannot be accepted as a solution to any of these problems mentioned. Thirdly, I want to highlight our recent study that we published in October uh, this month, uh, this year, uh, a, the largest study among healthcare workers in India uh, regarding healthcare violence. 
10%, 11% of doctors in the country, across the country, are they feel completely unsafe. They scored the lowest percentage, lowest level of safety in terms of doing night calls. 24% of doctors who responded, out of almost 4,000 doctors who responded, 24% said that they felt unsafe. Now, that is not a good situation for any person to take up uh, being a doctor as a profession. Because most doctors, uh, especially in the vulnerable segment, uh, if you're a junior doctor, say you're a postgraduate or a junior consultant, yes, you will be put in the front line and you may be surrounded by people who could attack you at any time. And that's not a good situation to be in. So measures have to be taken to make sure, not only for doctors, but patients also deserve uh, a, uh, a chance uh, to um, receive good care uh, by a good facility, regardless of whether it is private or public. Right. My last question to Dr. Anand as well as Dr. Ishwar Gilada. In fact, to both of you, I'm going to ask you the same question because I think this is something that the viewers also need to listen. Dr. Anand, to you, the first aspect of this question is, now, you know, you go to doctors and you heard Dr. Rajiv and other panelists, and you as well know this, they are so busy. They, they have so many patients. The patient is to doctor ratio is tremendous in India when you compare it to other countries, particularly in the government sector. It's enormous. And then you have in the private, you're of course paying through your nose as well as in going uh, particularly to the good hospitals. Now you go there, a doctor is busy and a doctor will scribble something on the, um, um, on, on his, um, pres on the prescription. One doesn't know what the diagnosis is. One doesn't understand what the diagnosis is. What does it mean? Uh, if the person is admitted, there would be rounds. The senior doctor would come in in a whiff of a minute, speak to the juniors and go off. These are big concerns as well. Yes, they are. Um, but the, again, you know, there is a reason for that, right? We are seeing a lot of overcrowding happening, especially um, in uh, in referral centers, whether that be secondary or tertiary, because we have a failure in the primary care system. If you're not able to get uh, simple ailments like cold and cough sorted out in primary care and everyone lands up in a referral hospital, then you're going to see huge lines, right? And you see huge lines, which means the doctors want to finish off because they also don't want to keep anyone waiting. You know, if you have a large OPD where 200 people are waiting to see you and you only have four or five hours, and then you have to also do rounds, do your teaching, do your research, do your admin duties, et cetera. You have to get through that crowd. And one way to do that is to do it at speed, which means that you will hardly have any time for interactions. And quality will have to be sacrificed to some extent. Of course, doctors and providers make best efforts. Even in that situation, they try to be as attentive and as responsive as possible. But sacrifices have to be made. And unfortunately, that means that a patient who sometimes has been waiting for literally days in some hospitals to get that two minute with the doctor might feel frustrated by that experience because they've not heard, had enough time to interact with the doctor for whom they've been waiting, right? And so from their perspective, that is where perhaps dissatisfaction comes in, frustration comes in. Of course, violence is not a solution to that. But then again, this is a larger systemic issue, right? Uh, everyone is a victim of this situation which has been created because we don't have a functioning system which allows for adequate time to be provided by the provider. So uh, again, fixing will need a systemic solution. Uh, you know, you if you can put more and more guards at the gate, but that's not going to stop the crowd of people who want to see someone who they see is a specialist and they want to get care from them. So I think this is something we really need to address uh, by more investments in the health sector. Dr. Ishwar Gilada, how would you look at this, Dr. Ishwar Gilada? I mean, this is... I mean, all is not well with the doctors as well. And again, as we said, violence cannot be tolerated, accepted at all. But uh, there's also a building frustration. And often there's, what does one do? One, I mean, what, as a doctor, as a practicing doctor, how would you tell your patients, your viewers, viewers who are watching you right now, what must they do if they are not happy, if they are concerned, if they have worries? Uh, I think basically there are three points I would like to make here. Number one is that uh, before being a doctor, you are a social animal. Before being that, you are a human being. So that doctor has to understand that he is first a human being, then a social animal. So try to socialize with the person who is coming before you. Uh, try to ask something which is beyond your diagnosis, beyond your treatment. Make a personal rapport. That is one thing. Secondly, there is always a saying that kismat ki badna se bhi hai, sahiya kya karega? Hakim, my brother, to Piriyat kya karega? Your doctor must have a passion, compassion, everything. 
and that you must be able to explain. Thirdly, most of the doctors they do not explain the diagnosis, thinking that isko kya samjega? Yeah, na gawar hai. But nowadays, actually, it was uh, important since beginning. But now it is more important because people come go already on Google. They have diagnosed everything. They have the thought of everything. All uh, consequences are known to them. Not may not be perfect, may not be scientific, but they have some knowledge. In that situation, you need to guide them properly. And fourthly, whenever it is required, you refer the person to a particular person. Don't try to be uh, all in one doctor uh, that you are the expert. You understand. But most important, what is happening in private sector is people think that doctor is taking money. If you calculate, doctor gets only five to ten percent of what the hospital charges. And hospitals are not run by doctors; they are run by business community. They are run by industrialists. So uh, doctors are just only because of the, their front. The, uh, in the back, everybody is different. And what, if we think that doctors are making money, we should not have allowed commercialization of medical education. Why did we allow private medical colleges? Why did we allow competition fees? If doctor is paying one crore or two crore for getting MBBS admission, three crore for post graduate, that doctor is going to recover every day, uh, every month five lakh minimum to pay that uh, interest of what he spent. So I think we should uh, stop that commercialization. I think this is a very big systemic problem. But to come to this issue, violence is not allowed. We must have a specific law. We must have a system, whether in government or private. And these uh, cases should be dealt with iron hand quickly as early as possible, so that we that acts as a deterrent to other people who would like to have such kind of violence. And most importantly, Bijan Mishra, I, I, I'm afraid system, I don't have much time. Female. Female. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to. Female. Bejar Mishra, one one last thing I have to ask you, Bejar Mishra, and Ishwar Gilada did mention that Doctor Ishwar Gilada addressed it from the doctor's point of view that what doctors must do, how they should not do what they are doing. But there's also the other side of consumers. What must they do? Here you have a perception by a family member that he was wronged. What should that a person like that do? There are legal recourses, but how much of that is really practical in a country like India? No, it is not. It is not, not more than a minute, sir. So, so we have enough laws in our country. You see, we have to go back to our old cultural system of family doctor. We have lost that. We have lost that totally. We don't have family doctor relationship now. Patients don't even know who the doctor is. The doctor doesn't know who the patient is. We have to know our neighborhood doctors. The, we have to build that, you know, family doctor relationship, which is missing totally in our country, which was our culture. The whole uh, medical professionals has lost that ethos, which Indian culture was. We have gone ahead and adopted only the Western culture. We have gone ahead and adopted and forgotten about our traditional healthcare. We forgot about our traditional healthcare, which gives okay. very economical uh, kind of an access to healthcare. And we, we don't want to encourage that. There is an infighting going on. Nobody wants to have integrative healthcare in our country. I mean, it's a pathetic condition. The, the patients okay. don't know where to go and what to do. And we don't have resources like, like, like the very well-to-do associations of the medical profession. We don't have those resources. The patients will go where? They will only go to the government. Right. They'll go to the regulator. Where else they can go? But they can't go there right. also because they don't have the resources. They can't engage a lawyer. They can't go to the court to fight a, a battle. We need the state governments to wake up, develop mechanisms, encourage the culture of family doctor, strengthen primary health care, strengthen the traditional health care which was there in our country for more than 2,000 years, bring it back into the forefront. Dr. Mishra, I think... Get uh... Bejan Mishra, I'm totally running out of time. You're raising some extremely important points. Uh, Dr. Shanti, I'm afraid I'll not be able to come to you. I think you're raising your hands as well. But I think all of our panelists would agree on two counts. One, doctors are going through a lot. Everything is not well with them either. But a threatened environment is just no way a doctor can function at all. But there's also the other side that all of us agree with. Consumers, in this case, patients or their families, need to be given space and means to be able to address their grievances in a very justiciable manner. If that's a word that I just coined, but you know, they have to have a perception of being granted 
justice rather than just raising a complaint with the hospital. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, Dr. Anand Bhan, Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan, Dr. Ishwar Gilada, um, Dr. Shanti A.R. Thank you. It's time for a very short break. On the other side, we'll bring you all the latest.